Okay, so now we're going to talk about trauma number three. In the first video, we talked really about the primary survey. And uh, in the second video, we talked about the secondary survey. And now we're going to talk really about uh, one thing. And that is chest trauma. And previously, we had mentioned that, you know, this whole thing really is the chest in here. And we had actually even broken down the chest into one more subdivided area, which was the anterior box, which goes from the uh, sternal notch between the nipples and the costal margins. So within the chest, we're really worried about two organs. We're worried about the lungs. And within the anterior box, we're worried about the heart. And there is, of course, one more organ, very important one in here, and that's the aorta. So as you remember from the previous videos, we like to break trauma down into two things, where the trauma is and the kind of trauma. And for this video, we're going to say the where is going to either be the chest or the anterior box. And the kind of trauma is, again, either going to be blunt or penetrating. So let's look at both of these in turn. Okay, first let's start with blunt trauma. Okay, I gotta admit, that's a kind of funny looking chest, but whatever. Let's say you got a guy who's driving along in his car, and he was texting while driving and not really paying attention, probably going about 40 miles an hour, when he hits some stationary object, say, a uh, fire hydrant here. The guy was wearing his seatbelt, and his airbag did go off, and he hit his chest pretty hard up against that airbag, and he even got a little bit of a See a bruising on his chest, which gave him like this seatbelt sign. He's got this seatbelt shaped bruise. And now he's complaining of chest pain. The entire chest is really hurting. So, what are you worried about? Well, what are the organs within the chest that can be injured? Take a sec and think about that. Okay, so you got your lungs and the heart and of course the aorta, and even the chest wall, like the ribs. So let's look at each one of these in turn. So this is blunt trauma to the chest. What's going to happen with blunt trauma to the ribs? Well, the main thing you're going to worry about is a fracture. And that can be a problem for several different reasons. First of all, just rib fractures hurt, and so they prevent people from taking deep breaths, and so they splint their breathing. And then they can get atelectasis and develop a pneumonia. Secondly, the rib fractures are sharp. They can cause an underlying pneumothorax, which could then interfere with breathing. And if you have multiple rib fractures that are all together, contiguous rib fractures, you could have what's called a flail chest, in which a segment of ribs is going to move opposite to the rest of the chest and thereby disrupt that negative pressure system that uh, makes us breathe. As you... Uh, inhale your chest expands and you develop negative pressure in your chest but that segment that's not attached to anything is going to get sucked in and not allow the lungs to expand so how are you going to deal with these well for pain you just give them meds for a pneumothorax you could listen or you could even just get a chest x-ray and see if you can find a pneumothorax there but no that chest x-rays are not perfect at looking for pneumothoraces you will miss small ones have you ever had the experience where you drove home one night and parked your car and then you came back in the morning only to find that your tire was flat? You looked at it and you found a nail in the tire, which you had probably driven over uh, the day before, so that tire was slowly leaking air. Well, your lungs, they can do the same thing, slowly leak air. So on the first x-ray, you may not see the pneumothorax, but as it slowly leaks and leaks, the pneumothorax develops. So you get an x-ray six hours later and you see that pneumothorax there. And you'd probably need to put in a chest tube or something like that to get that air out. And for the flail chest, well, we used to tape down the chest, but now you may have to even intubate them and do positive pressure ventilation. So now let's look at the lungs. And we already talked about the pneumothorax that could be caused by the rib fracture. Uh, what else could happen? You could get a bruised lung or a pulmonary contusion. And on x-ray, that would look just like a uh, big diffuse infiltrates bilaterally. So we talked about that we would need a chest x-ray for the pneumothorax and probably a chest tube. And for the pulmonary contusion, it's just supportive management. So as they might get hypoxic from their contusion, you might have to put them on more O2 or maybe even intubate them. 
And we talked about the heart, too. What, what's going to happen to the heart? Well, you can also get a cardiac contusion, in which case the heart might not beat effectively, and you're going to get uh, hypotensive from that. Now, this is difficult to diagnose. Like other bruises, they take some time to develop. And so you've got to watch the patients. But how do you know which patients to watch? It's definitely a tough thing. And so the thing that we'll probably, we usually do is get an EKG, and if there's any abnormality there, then you just admit them and watch them for 24 hours, keeping them on a cardiac monitor. And finally, we have the aorta. And the badness we had here, what we call a traumatic aortic injury, is a possible transection. And if you remember from the previous video, we noted that the aorta here is... Uh, tethered to the spine in some areas, but not in others. So if you have a sudden acceleration or deceleration, inertia is going to keep this part moving where uh, just the fact that this thing is stopped is going to, is tethered down and stops is going to keep this part from moving. So this part won't move because it's tied down, and this part will keep moving. And so what you'll get is a little tear there. And if you have a complete transection, well, that person's going to die at the scene because they're just going to exsanguinate all, the, all their blood out. But if you have just a tiny little rent there in the aorta, that may just leak a small amount, and that will be kind of trapped in the adventitia. And it'll stay there, uh, but it'll start collecting, and eventually you know that that blood is going to just leak out of there. And when that happens, you're going to have that catastrophic bleeding like you would have if you had a full transection. They're going to just leak out all their blood and die quickly. So we already said that the workup for that is going to be an aortogram, so either you know a, a traditional angiogram or today we're going to use a CT angiogram. Looking for that uh, tear there where there might be a little blush of contrast that gets outside of the aorta. Anyone who has that has to go immediately to the OR to get that fixed because that's a ticking time bomb. But who gets it? Does everybody get a CT angiogram? Of course not. Well, pretty much every trauma patient is going to get a chest x-ray. So anyone who has a wide mediastinum on the chest x-ray, you've got to worry about this making it wide. So those guys probably should get an angiogram. Uh, but not all of them will have a wide mediastinum. And so you might also say anyone who meets certain mechanism criteria, such as going more than 30 miles an hour and having an acceleration or deceleration change of 30 miles an hour, or falling from 30 feet or three stories. So let's go back to our patient who was in a car crash going 40 miles an hour and hit that fire hydrant. Now he's got this uh, seatbelt sign here, and he said his chest was very tender. What are we going to do? Well, for the ribs, you could just palpate the chest and see if you feel any tenderness. And if you do, if you feel point tenderness over a rib, perhaps he's got a rib fracture. Uh, pretty much everybody's going to get a chest x-ray. But you also got to listen to bilateral breath sounds to see if they are symmetric. If we see a pneumothorax, and of course we're going to get a chest tube. On the chest x-ray, you might see that bilateral uh, plural of it uh, looks like bilateral infiltrates that are diffuse, and that would signify a pulmonary contusion. So you might watch them for a little while just to make sure that they are not developing that, especially if they have that mechanism that we described earlier. If their chest is tender, I'd probably also do the EKG, looking for the cardiac contusion. And remember, any abnormality means they get 23 hours of monitoring. And our guy, well, he met the mechanism criteria, and so if he has any chest wall tenderness or abnormal chest x-ray, uh, let's get that CT angiogram so you know that this guy's getting this too. So in summary, we have a, a gentleman who was wearing his seatbelt and hit head-on a stationary object going about 40 miles an hour, and now he's got bruising along his seatbelt. He's got chest wall tenderness. We got a chest x-ray. Let's say that thing was normal. Uh, we did feel some tenderness along the ribs. Uh, he, he doesn't, so we're giving him some pain medicines for that, but we did not notice any flail chest. Our chest x-ray did not show any pneumothorax, so initially at least we don't think we have a pneumothorax there. 
We're going to keep observing him, maybe keep him on the pulse ox to make sure he doesn't develop a pulmonary contusion. We do an EKG, and uh, we see sinus tachycardia, and that's it. So that's not really any abnormality, so we're not too worried about it. But if we saw any ectopy, maybe even PVCs, we might just say, hey, you know, let's be safe and keep him for 23 hours. But we did not see that on our guy. We did, however, know that this mechanism was pretty severe, and he's got chest wall tenderness. And even though his x-ray was normal, we chose to do a CT angiogram looking for this aortic transection because we know that's badness waiting to happen, and we don't want to miss that. Okay, so that's blunt chest trauma. In the next video, we will look at penetrating chest trauma. See you there.